I guess first off, let's let me just say thank you for uh, for the to the organizers for organizing this and and to all of you for being here for this talk because uh, as it turns out, there is a competing talk in the other room that also would be about the Internet of Things and over-the-air updates and and kind of similar topics. So uh, plus, I think they have better chairs in there. So <laughs> I'm just super happy to see. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you can leave now. <laughs> so, so we are kind of the hardcore team here. Uh, we're, we're okay with the hardest chairs. Uh, so this is also the last talk of the day. I think we, we have the, we're actually going into the other room after this one. So it might be, we don't, we, we don't know that yet, but maybe that talk is much better. We'll see that when we get in there. There's euphoria. Spontaneous singing, you know, there's just incredible uh, talk, but we'll see. Uh, so uh, I will be talking about stack smashing uh, 100 streetlights before sunrise. Something that could come out of basically not doing what Daniel talked about. <laughs> but that actually can happen even if you do that. Uh, so it's, uh, and there is no real moral to this story. There is no message. There's just it's just a a, uh, a cool story. Uh, so I think that's the that's a good kind of last talk for the day. You can just uh, relax and sit back. Uh, so my name is Adam. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of, of the company ThinkSquare. And uh, actually, as it turns out, and I was quite baffled to see this, uh, I I looked this up yesterday, and uh, I am. According to Wikipedia, so sorry about this, Daniel, sorry about this, I am the only one, <laughs> the only Swedish inventor in this century. Yeah, Wikipedia says so. I'm the only guy here. <laughs> so I think, and I, I don't, I, I mean, I'm, I mentioned here, I can't really edit this, but I think at least Daniel will be here. So maybe tonight, Maybe someone will have edited this. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> so, so this is that's actually pretty cool. It's a, it's, a, it's a cool thing to actually realize this. But my background and the reason why I'm, I guess I'm here today uh, is uh, I also have this 20-ish this year history of doing open source stuff. I, I, uh, back in the year 2000, I did a, an open source project called Light IP, which is in the embedded arena. Uh, it's the IP, an IP stack, so the, the piece of software in an operating system that is able to communicate using the IP protocols, uh, TCP, UDP, ICMP, and IP. Uh, this was very successful as an open source project in the sense that I could leave the project and it just kept going. And I think it's still active. At least people still actively use this a lot. You can see it here and there popping up. You know, Google Fuchsia had a new operating system called this was the operating system's IP stack was this. So it kind of pops up everywhere. Uh, really quite widely used. Uh, but <coughs> I, I left the project since like 15 or so years back. I started another project called Contiki Operating System, which was also in the same kind of embedded area doing networked systems, uh, except this one was, was the first system that it ran on. The first release was on the Commodore 64. It was the first native operating system with, an, with a web browser, uh, web server, IEC client, could all run at the same time. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, this one is uh, actually the basis, in a way, for the tech and the company that, that me and a couple of colleagues started called ThingSquare uh, seven years back now. We just took a crazy leap and tried to do something f in the real world, something real. Uh, and we're, we've been doing it ever since. Uh, we're... Uh, we now have customers in all continents except Antarctica. So if anyone knows anyone <laughs> in Antarctica, <laughs> could talk to me. Actually, we signed a, signed a deal yesterday that places in, in Africa. So that was the kind of the, the last blank spot on the map except uh, Antarctica. Uh, and now this is, this is it. This is the, the end of the line now. This is the most important thing is here today. So. Uh, what what we do just to kind of get your background what, what what ThinkSquare is is doing and what we're what we're uh, into at a very high level 
the problem we're solving is that there's lots of information in the real world, the physical data, that uh, is hard to get to. It's hard to, to figure this out without pulling it out using wireless technology, and that's what we do. We, we put some wireless stuff in there and we get this data out. So that could be, for example, the number of people in this room is important to know for scheduling for the university. How many, how many people are in this room when we have a, a class or, or other activities? And we can, if we know that number of people, we can schedule more effectively. Also, if there's a fire, the firefighters could, could uh, know that there's lots of people in here, less people in some other place. Uh, so by having, say, uh, IR detectors on all the entry and exit points, we can get a pretty good uh, estimate of that. So this is the kind of information that's out there in the real world uh, that is valuable but it's really hard to get to without some wireless technology, and we provide that tech. Uh, so, it's and, and practice what we do is wireless software, all, all the way from the, the wireless chips that goes into all those things that, that collect this data, all the way up to the cloud and everything in between. Uh, so a couple of, of, of things, the software is good looking, and I mean that in the sense that, that we can deploy it and have a nice visual for our customers to sell to their customers, and you know, everyone's really happy, but also in the sense that we have very strict style guidelines for the code. Uh, <laughs> so it actually looks pretty good. So we want to em really emphasize this point here. Uh, at very low power, we can run on, on things like coin cell batteries, tiny chips, uh, very efficient. Wireless networking, mesh networking, large scale networks, hundreds of thousands of, of devices in each network. And the most important thing uh, here today is the over the air updates. This is a kind of a killer feature if you have thousands of wireless devices out there and you want to do an update, you really need to want, you really want to be able to do that. You can't collect things and reflash them using a physical tool to do it. It's, it's not a viable uh, procedure, so you want to have this. Except the problem is that you may mess things up, and that's what we did here. Uh, so uh, here are just a few examples of, of, of customers of ours doing customer feedback buttons, you know, those, those things where you, you push a smiley face or a uh, frowny face or you know, uh, to tell the store how you feel in certain situations. Might be, you know, are the bananas good today? Yes or no. Are the queue lines too long? Yes or no. Uh, and lots of other things. So this is a, a Dutch company doing this one here. Uh, tiny buttons, those are completely wireless, so they are battery operated. You can put them on glass walls anywhere. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, in store purchase interactions. So how many people are actually interacting with the white goods at the white goods store, you know, the, the, the ovens or the, the, uh, the dishwashers? That information helps the store to create a better store uh, for them, I guess, uh, especially to sell them, sell more stuff, uh, more efficient. Uh, exit sign monitoring, this was the one thing that, that, was that we could have used in this room. Actually, if we use it in this room and in the other competing room, we wouldn't have been able to sell the score by that time. So maybe it's good for us that we didn't have it here. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> Elevator monitoring. Elevators are, are they're moving up and down, uh, and they're used in various places, various uh, uh, different amounts of time. So for example, the, the bottom floor usually has 50% of all uh, movements, because you either go up or you go down. So you have to replace the things on the, the bottom floor more often than on the higher floors, except you really don't know which ones of the higher floors unless you measure how the movement is, is, uh, is doing. So we can do that and we can more, be more efficient in, in doing servicing on these elevators. Smart gardening, and yes, it's cannabis. <laughs> these are cannabis plants. Uh, this is one of the, uh, this, uh, forgive the pun, it's, it's completely intended. It's, it's a huge, it's a growing market. It's a growing market, yes, it is. Uh, especially this cannabis thing is, it's, crazy how you know Canada legalized it. a lot of places in the US have legalized it now Canada is exporting cannabis to Amsterdam <laughs> 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 apparently so we have a, a, a several customers actually in this area doing things like like lighting fixtures sensors making sure that all the, the plants are growing as they should street lighting and here's what the this is the, the kind of the, the core of the 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 talk here today, street lighting, so large scale networks. And I'm gonna get back to that some more, but here we wanna do things like, like control the lamps and know if the, the poles have been have changed in their orientation, which could happen, say that someone runs into it and kind of changes its orientation. So the tech that we do, uh, <coughs> we use the Contiki operating system, the one that from, from back then, uh, 
inside those chips that we have deployed. Art uh, typically ARM Core is M3s, so those are the, the microprocessors that are in those wireless chips. Those are, they're pretty, s pretty small, uh, 16K RAM, uh, 128K flash, and the most popular version that we are using right now, is, it's pretty tight. Uh, we're using uh, low-power IPv6 networking, coin cell batteries. Some of this is, is <laughs> it's really quite hard to get that right. Uh, sub 1 gigahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, no JS, a lot of, so it's, it's really C and JavaScript. So it, when someone said, you know, what's the other language? Of, of course, I thought JavaScript, the safe language, right? The one we all know. <laughs> so, so this is the, the, the kind of stuff that we do. Uh, and this is what it typically looks like. We just break it down. All those examples here uh, are work like this. There are a bunch of wireless devices. They are chips, wireless chips, uh, single chip. <sighs> yes, I think someone did spot the Easter egg here. Uh, if you can read what it says here, uh, 6581. So that made us. It's the SID chip, it's the music chip in the Commodore 64. <laughs> it's one of the most, single most popular chips in the world ever, I think, in the history uh, of anything. <laughs> but uh, we actually don't use the SID chips. I just used it as an illustration here. But it's, a, uh, it's wireless chips talking to other wireless chips. Uh, and they can be large. They can be several uh, uh, square kilometers uh, out here. Or they can be small. Some kind of access point. It could be an edge server or something like your. This is a Raspberry Pi. I chose this uh, illustrate here. It's uh, some kind of server. It can be local or it can be on the cloud. So this is kind of the, the framework of things that, that we always uh, tend to have uh, in our setups. So the problem, <laughs> the challenge, is how do you do software development for networks of thousands of devices. I mean, it's, 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 uh, we all know how hard it is to program one program. <laughs> like we just saw the previous talk, it was really about like, this one program, uh, doing all these tests of one program. So one device is, is kind of a challenge in itself. And especially in the case where um, we'd have those extreme constraints we want to run things in, in point coin cell batteries, which means that we really need to, to sleep a lot. I mean, every little time we wake up, we'll just drain the battery little by little. But it's, uh, it's, it's not, a lot of, uh, not a lot of energy in those. So we really need to be super uh, efficient in how we work. The, uh, the memory is unforgiving. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's literally five or six times a week that we run into the, the limit of this. You know, five bytes overflow. Oh, you know, we need to do something. Or four bytes here. It's, it's always those tiny little amounts. We're really pushing this against the, kind of the edge. Uh, but it's, it's, again, it's, it's one device. It's relatively easy to do. You can do things like printf for debugging. How many here use printf for debugging? <laughs> yes, everyone. <laughs> How many here use something else besides printf for debugging? Okay, so <laughs> <my favorite ten. laughs> but we can do that here. We can actually we can do better. We can do use LEDs, so that we <laughs> it's also another trick. Uh, but but things like uh, logic analyzers, we can look at at you know sniff, sniff buses and stuff, and actually make sure that things do as they 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 should do on one device. So now the next step is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them, right? So now you have two things talking to each other. So you can't, s for example, you cannot just single step one of them because the other one will just keep running. So now you have created this, this situation where you have s uh, a coordination problem that you need to deal with. You can still do things like printfs and LEDs and, and uh, hardware sniffers and, and all that because it's relatively manageable. You can have it on a desk. That's, that's sort of fine. Uh, but then just adding three more, now it kinda gets kind of hard to make this just physically manage. Because you have five of these. And typically, if you have a, uh, an embedded device, it's a, it's a uh, printed circuit board, maybe like this. Uh, and uh, you have all sorts of things sticking out of this, wires sticking out. You have cables in. So each, each uh, uh, 
work area is kind of like this. So five of these is pretty much what you can handle on one desk. Uh, and not to mention the fact that you're now coordinating a lot more because there's no way you can do anything like, like coordinating uh, printf's or LEDs. And, well, LEDs is actually doable because you can visually see if they're synchronized and do th things like that, but it's getting harder. So you need to have automated tools to deal with this. Uh, at some at this stage, you're, you're kind of up at that level. And <coughs> now adding another uh, five into this, you're out of space in your desk. So you need to have like a bookshelf, uh, something larger to just to physically work with this. So that's actually a challenge, just the physical working with this, the physically uh, act of working with this. And not to mention the fact that now you're starting to get into problems with, like if you have 10% failure rates of things, well, you're, you're starting to actually see this happening every time. Uh, so uh, complexity just increases at every step of the way, and if you're up to 100, now it's it's really hard to f to like physically work with this. If you're the first step is just f unpacking and and putting these out in some kind of test bed, that takes time. If you're going to physically reprogram these with a cable, that takes time as well. Plus the fact that now one percent failure rate happens all the time. Uh, and the coordination and the congestion in networks and everything that could go wrong starts to go wrong. So it's actually quite challenging to be up at this stage uh, with 100 devices. Adding more, surprisingly enough, doesn't do much more of a problem here because you're kind of up at that, that maxed out the problems at 100 uh, devices. It's so hard to work with uh, in, the, in the same way as you've been doing up here that you've have had to change the way that you work anyway. And adding more will not actually change that as much. That would change other things, like on the back end or the front end. You have to display this in a way. Now, uh, with 100 devices, you could have a, like a list of, of list display and see what th what's going on. With 1,000, you ha really have to have some kind of grid on the screen. So there are other types of, of challenges that, that arise when you start to get towards here. But the, the, the key takeaway here is that it's uh, kind of exponentially uh, adding to each, uh, each step. So how do, you, how do we deal with this? How do we deal with the scale when we're doing large scale, uh, thousands of, of node networks? Well, the, f the first one is uh, to use simulators. Uh, this is the, the really the only way to, to look into and seeing what's going on. Because if you're doing a simulator, you actually have a chance to, to do things like single stepping. You can, <coughs> excuse me, you can look at at the detail level, what is going on at every single point in time because you control the time of the entire network. So uh, if you're doing things like uh, Node.js level, you can easily do tens of thousands of nodes, but those are not that uh, uh, close to the actual hardware because you have to rewrite everything in, in JavaScript. So you kind of test the logic of things, but not really the, the real behavior. <coughs> we can do uh, simulation at the C level, so we recompile the code into native code, which we then plug into a simulator that can run this at high speed, and uh, we can run easily run tests on thousands of nodes here. So we can see it, the, the kind of the grand behavior, the high level, top level behavior, but we don't really look into the details. Uh, so to look into the details, which we also <laughs> also need to do if we're going to make this super low power, make sure everything is sleeping because it has to sleep and communicate at the same time, and the sleeping really affects the communication. So we're going to the emulated level, which means that we're running the actual code that runs on the hardware, except we're running it on an emulator. And in the simulator, the network simulator, we can do, do this with hundreds of nodes. Uh, actually, 100 nodes is, is quite tough on a laptop. It's about 40 or 50 or so. 100 we can run on a uh, cloud backend style server. <coughs> And then we had to verify this because this is still emulated, it's just software, so we don't really know what's going on on the real hardware until we put it onto the test in the real hardware test bed. Uh, we actually have a 100 node test bed in our, in, our <coughs> in our office that lets us do those things where we can uh, look at the, the behavior at scale on the real hardware. Uh, but then we also need to do the automated testing. You know, we've, as we saw <laughs> talked about just now, we saw that we need uh, automated testing to, to catch those bugs that we always have. So yes, we do that. We run those. I think we're actually, you mentioned, I think, 20 hours of time. 
I think we're about 10 hours of time. <laughs> For some reason, this is faster. Uh, I'm not sure why, because we, we're, but maybe because those are, you're running more platforms and stuff. We kind of only have a few platforms, but large scale in terms of nodes and networks. So we just have to deal with those things. Uh, uh, every change, everything that we do, we run through all those tests and the simulators and the test bed we use as well for development. Uh, so this is uh, what the uh, test bed looks like in our office. We have a few of those Lego guys to defend it from. I don't know, but <laughs> you never know what will hit you. Uh, but those are, and we've equipped them, in this case, with, with LEDs, so we can see that we were testing street lighting. In this case, we saw the kind of ground behavior of street lights. Uh, this is a view of the network created by the, the nodes. I, I took this uh, yesterday. We're running some tests. So you see some rearrangements of the, of the multi-hop nature here. Uh, but it kind of looks like this. And seeing here, you kind of get a feeling for the, the complexity if we're going to try and see what happens at this specific node. Um, there are quite a few nodes in there to, to, uh, that we'll have to deal with. Uh, here's another view. When we configure, so we can do things like configuring this network to be, in this case, a 100 hop network. So that means that when we talk about hops, that means that to, to talk to this node, so from here, there's a network that kind of goes around, and I think the ultimate node is somewhere here. No, I don't know, maybe up somewhere. Uh, it has to go through all the other nodes to reach that and back. And the reason why we do this is so that we can test some of the extreme cases of a very, very long network. So in this case, 100 hops. Uh, so this is another view. In this case, we're, we're actually just pinging uh, the end node. And we're kind of seeing the, the message getting forwarded. So this was, ah, here, that's the end node. Uh, so we have a sniffer that listens to all the the messages in the network, and we just display it like this. Uh, and <coughs> here is the same view in the simulator. So it's a much more regular <laughs> uh, way of looking at it, because now we can simulate everything. But this is, again, 100 nodes, and we're sending ping messages back and forth, and we're drawing arrows. So the question is, why are we, why are we doing this extreme 100 hops uh, simulator? And the reason is, those street lights, where we were trying to see what would happen if we'd have a kind of a degenerate case of extremely long street line network that would just be 100 street lights all the way down one lonely road uh, with one access point at the end. Would we, would we be able to do with that situation? And yeah, we were able to do that. Um, but of course, I mean, seeing it in the simulator like that is, is one thing. I mean, I think that's really cool. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, don't we all, right? It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, we like the complexity because we're kind of into computer science. But haven't we also all been wanting to stand in the crossroads at night and just turn on and off streetlights? <laughs> like, like, boom, boom, boom. Like Tim the Enchanter? kind of Monty Python style, or it sounds like you know, Marvel Comics, you know, streetlight gang, you could go out, control streetlight, superpower. And as it turns out, we got this video from a customer of ours doing just that. So look at this. Whew. They're actually turning off the streetlights. He's standing there with his phone, turning it on and off like this. <laughs> so this was a closed off road at night. Uh, it was a university with <laughs> no access there, so it was, it was safe to do this. But still, it's a kind of a cool superpower to have, <laughs> like to be able to turn it on and off street lights like this. And this is what it did actually look like. So this is the, this is the topological view of this, this street light network. We can see that the lines being drawn here is uh, uh, is the multi-hop nature of this network. And we can see that sometimes they, if there is lots of uh, open space, they would just go directly 
to the access point there. Sometimes I would go through other uh, street lights like this. And it's really up to how the, the physical configuration of, the, of the, the, the environment here. And it just adapts to that. So this was the situation. Uh, and I think, so this is, in each and every of those lamps, there is a bit of hardware and a bit of software, of course. And what had happened now was that our customer had managed to, to upload a piece of code into those 100 streetlights that they had in this proof of concept uh, system that made them unable to update the system again because they made a critical flaw. And, and one of the critical flaws that was, I think, very difficult to catch in simulation, so we, it, was, uh, it, was, it was easy enough to make and difficult to catch. Uh, and the problem was this. We have a, a flash memory, uh, I think 8 megabytes or so, looks like this, uh, on, on one each of, of these devices. And it is controlled by a pen called Chip Select. This one is uh, asserted when a uh, when we want to talk to this chip. Otherwise, we just uh, pull it. I think it's actually on the other. It's going up when it's not, and down when it's we want to talk to it. Either case, we just want to tell this chip, "Hey, I want to talk to you." And this chip, we store the uh, the update for the the firmware update process uses this external flash to store. The, the firmware image my, while it's, it's uh, doing the upload. This is encrypted. We have the, the encryption keys and the microcontroller. So there are lots of, uh, there are lots of layers to this. And, and um, our, our customers said, we, something's happened. We just can't do this anymore. It's just stop working when we try the update. And we have only, you know, <laughs> tomorrow we have this important de demo. We need to get this stuff out there. Uh, and it took us some time just to figure this out, that it was actually, the problem was in, in this one line of code where they have inadvertently changed the, the pin configuration of this pin. Uh, so they've done an update that was functional, except it included a problem that made the next update impossible to do. <laughs> so they came to us and uh, they said, is there anything that you guys can think of that you can do? So. Uh, Fortunately, we're not just things square by day, but sometimes uh, we're also things square by night. <laughs> uh, we pull out our trusty old green neon style screen CRT monitor terminals and uh, we get to work. <laughs> and we, we, you know, we try to figure out how do we deal with this problem? How do we solve the problem of actually getting this because this was really way down in the boot code of the system before anything else. So there was no way that we could just go in there and affect it because immediately when the system booted up, it just set the wrong pin. And we were going through <laughs> our change logs uh, to see if there was anything there that we could see. We were going through the Git uh, repositories. You know, is there anything that, that we could see? But <laughs> unfortunately, we used all those uh, uh, tools, well, they, not really all of them, but most of the tools that we just saw. So we, we had found all the problems that we could potentially exploit to try to fix this in somehow. But then finally we, we found this one thing, that we had actually given uh, our customer, in this case, a pre-release uh, of, of the software uh, that used an undocumented call inside the code that we now had changed. So now it could take 8-bit uh, values, it could only take 7-bit values before, and this actually turn out to expose one little tiny uh, stack uh, problem inside the code. One array was allocated on the stack with just way too little uh, uh, memory space compared to what we could actually enter in into this. Uh, so we saw this out that we could see, hey, you know, maybe, maybe there is a way that we can just exploit this. Maybe there is a way we can create a stack smash attack that fixes this. <laughs> And we, we were super happy to see this, act, this little array as three bytes there, and we could actually enter uh, through the APIs. So this was access control, but, but still, the APIs could, could allow us to send 128 bytes, actually 120, I think, uh, into that, that would then, through the customer code, get copied into this array. 
And this allowed us to create a, a stack smash attack. So just a, a quick rundown of what the stack smash attack does. Normally, in a computer system, you have the stack that keeps uh, you in line with how the function calls are being made. You know, you jump here and jump there. And at this, this point in the stack, you store the return address that you're going back. So when you know that you're going to go back, you can just find that place. Uh, and you just kind of casually jumps back. And when you do a, a stack smash attack, what you're doing is you're inserting uh, data onto the stack that allows you to control the, uh, the where and the code this now jumps. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, this is not always the uh, all that's needed to do this, but you need to have some way of inserting known code somewhere else. Uh, sometimes you can do that on the stack. We could not do that here. That was way too small. Uh, but we found another place where we could insert <laughs> a piece of code that in a semi-known location, we had to try it a couple of times to actually make it place it in the right location and then make the jump like this. Uh, we found this injection vector, the lighting schedule, uh, the, the, the piece of code that controlled when, how and when the lamps would turn on and off. Uh, that had a, a, a little space that we could use, 48 bytes, uh, that we could insert. We can then make the... the uh, uh, so this is the actual code that we did. Uh, what it did was to update the, this... Uh, uh, the address or, or uh, update the pin of this chip select uh, configuration. So now that was stored in the, f in the RAM. Fortunately, this was stored in the RAM. It was not a hard code to constant, but we found the place in RAM. So we could send a piece of code that would, uh, on a specific signal, uh, update this to the new pin and then do the magic to kind of restore the stack to a norm no normal state again and, and then do this. So this is the code that we injected, the compiled code looked like that. <laughs> uh, and, the, uh, and we were able to place that in, in a specific place in RAM. And this is the exploit code. So typically, this is kind of how it usually looks. There's a bunch of similar bytes when uh, you try to kind of make it jump into the code that would execute the right, uh, <laughs> uh, the actual injected code that you did. So step three, do it. For each and every one of those 100 streetlights, uh, we were write, wrote the script uh, that would verify the firmware version that was actually running the same problematic version that was able to be hot patched. We connected this device over TLS, over this, this uh, long network, uh, because that this, uh, to inject this code, we needed to have a, an active TLS connection. We injected the code as a lethal lighting schedule into the uh, RAM of the, the, uh, the lamp, trigger the, the stack buffer overflow, we send a specific command, wait for the device to report back, and do this again for all. And once all of these had, had, had a, a, a clean, a, a, well, cleanly applied the hotfix or the stack smash exploit, we can then do the working firmware update. So we set this to work in the, uh, in the evening because uh, this took, took some, uh, about five to 10 minutes per device to go through this. And then we, they had the, the update to the working firmware. It took another two hours uh, to update the entire network. We just kind of started and hoped that things would work. Uh, and woke up the following morning to our freshly squeezed uh, stack smashed network of 100 street lights all running the new working version of the code. Uh, we were happy. Our customers even happier because they could now show this to their uh, customer that had come to this location just to see their, their new street lights uh, in action. <laughs> so, again, the there's no real moral to the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a cool thing. <laughs> the moral is you have to leave at least one security hole. Yes. <laughs> yes. So forget about you know, 90, no, sorry, keep in mind 90% of what you heard in the previous talk, right? So that's one, <laughs> one hole. Can't choose the rest. No. No, 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 no. This would not be possible in the rest. You have to stick to C or JavaScript to do things like this. <laughs> And uh, 
that is my, uh, the end of my talk here. I think we have some time for uh, a few questions, if there are, uh, before we leave for the uh, end session. Quick one. Yes. Um, the simulation and the emulation and the real uh, environment. Have you had a, a chance to measure the, uh, the differences, the tracking error between the environments? And in what areas do you have the biggest uh, uh, difference in, in behavior, timing, jitter, and so forth? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think that the, the, the answer really is that we're looking at different things when we're looking at the different. Uh, we're looking for at the, the large scale, the sea level, we're looking for the logic of the system to make sure that, that it behaves as it should. Uh, so so the, the things like time are very different. But we want, we want to make sure that we can see that the actual behaviors is operating correctly. Whereas in the, in the emulated environment, we have the timing correct. So we can do things like look at the power consumption. Uh, whereas, I mean, we kind of verify the logic of the correctness of the, the system in, in a logical way. And, and then we can see the, the uh, correctness of the system in the, uh, the behavioral way or the, the, the low level way. So we're really looking for different things. So it's, we don't, don't really have a good way to kind of uh, compare the metrics of the two because they are, they are different, uh, functionally different. But they're running the same code, but, but uh, in different ways. More questions? So I saw your beautiful uh, IKEA test bench there. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess you you run your things on different hardware. Yeah. Different hardware revisions. Maybe the next revision will have those uh, SPI pins switched. Yeah. So how how do you test this? Are you like manually testing things, or do you have an automated system for this? And how do you take care of different uh, permutations of these hardware? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. We, we don't, uh, we have to, to some extent, we have an automated system for this. To, uh, we have uh, all the hardware, uh, the, the, all the CPU types that we ever run, uh, we have a setup for those. For the, for the things like pin configuration, we don't. We have to rely on like, running on, on the real thing. Uh, but what we added, so after this, this problem we had here, for example, we did add a, a, a sanity check at the boot to make sure that we could actually access the, the flash chip and decode it. And if we couldn't, we just discarded that, that uh, version of the system, that, that firmware. Uh, so we kind of evolved the system by, by <laughs> running into real world problems. It's, it's, hard, uh, it's hard to foresee some of the things that could happen. Uh, so the, the things that we have seen we try to add tests for them, and we do the testing on, on kind of the, 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 the CPU style level, but not at the specific hardware level. Like this. So do you keep the bootloader in the uh, CPU's uh, flash and the external uh, SPI flash for the application? So you can sort of between uh, two different programs in case one goes haywire? Yeah, we do. We actually keep the, we, we, we keep the entire system has to run from the, the CPU flash. Uh, but we have, the, the external flash is much larger. So there we can store several versions and then flip back to, if we indicate that there's a problem, we can actually flip back into another version. Uh, but those are, so, <laughs> a problem like this, uh, where we don't even have access to the flash is really difficult to recover from. Thanks. Uh, I'm just curious, you said that you are using Cortex ARM M3s with only 60 kilobytes of RAM and uh, Node.js. Are, uh, are you having any kind of performance troubles when doing that? Yeah, the, the Node.js is running on the back end. Ah. So that's where. <laughs> <laughs> 
quite a challenge, though. It might be possible to get something close to Node.js running on 60k, but it's kind of a challenge. <laughs> we're, not, we're, we're good, but we're not quite that good. <laughs> You mentioned uh, Radio there. Uh, what kind of mesh function do you use? You wrote that yourself, or is it uh, something that's on the market? Yeah, it's uh, we use. Uh, I mean, it, it's our system, but it's IPv6 meshing with the uh, protocol called Ripple, uh, the mesh routing protocol. In, it's an IETF standard. Uh, back in we developed it. We were sort of part of the development back some 12, 15 years back. Uh, but uh, uh, it's a it's an IETF standard, standard protocol. Okay, thank you. Thanks for a nice feature. Okay, thanks. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you.